Yeah, live. Okay, hello. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? I hope you are having a good day. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome back to a new live event with Career Foundry. Uh, we are going to give it a moment so people can get it and get settled. First, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Belinda, Junior Event Manager here at Career Foundry, hosting this event from Berlin. And today I'm welcome to, I'm pleased to welcome back again to the channel, Kylie Weber. Hi, Kylie. How are you? Very well, Belinda. Very, very well. Happy to be here. That's great. It's great. Thank you so much for being with us today and welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. Pleasure. Um, so Kylie will uh, introduce herself later at the beginning of the presentation. But before, I would like to mention a little bit about herself. She is a career founder UI design graduate who is currently working as product designer in her very own company, Professional Creations. This is an amazing um, achievement. So congratulations, Kylie, for that, for this um, great career change. Um, also, Kylie was with us in previous uh, webinars, speaking about her career change from hospitality to you, I design, and also she dedicated an entire um, webinar to speak about how to create a powerful portfolio. Uh, they were super in insightful and very interesting. So if you would like to watch them, they are still available on our events page on the demand section at the bottom of the page. So uh, the recording are there. But today it's all about um, how to become a product designer from scratch. While people are joining, please let us know from where you are watching us from. Um, uh, on the chat, in the chat, sorry, that you can see on the right hand side. Uh, we would love to make this as interactive as possible. So please feel free to drop any comment you would like uh, to share with us. Um, before we kick off, I would love to introduce you to Career Foundry. Career Foundry is the online school for your career change into tech. We get you from complete beginner to job ready tech professional in UX and UI design and help you land your first job in the field. We are not any old school. Our programs are so flexible that you don't need to quit your job to change your career. You get regular one-to-one -one mentorship for not one, but two industry experts. And if you don't land a job within 180 days of graduation, we refund your duration. And this is our job guarantee. And please let me also quickly tell you a few of our house rules. This webinar will be recorded and we will send the recording out tomorrow via email for those who are registered in Big Marker. And also, if you have any question for Kylie's, um, please drop them in the chat and we will answer them at the Q&A at the end. And if you have any uh, question about Career Foundry programs, please book a call with one of our program advisors. They are experts in the field. They love speaking with you and help you in your career change, the same as they did with Kylie. And you can do that by clicking on the sticky note in the chat. And with that said, I won't take any more time of you, Kylie, for the presentation. So I'll disappear into the background and I'll be back for the Q&A uh, after the presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And Kylie, the floor is yours. Enjoy it. Great. Thank you so much, Belinda. And I want to thank everyone for being here today and taking the time to, to be part of this webinar. I'm so happy to be here. I love doing these collaborations with Career Foundry. And it's just such a, I mean, a benefit that I get to work with Belinda. So that's, that's always just a great positive for me. Uh, yeah, so to just give you an idea of what we'll be covering in this webinar. I mean, it's, I mean, the title speaks for itself. Um, you know, how to become a product designer from scratch. Uh, from scratch is a little bit, uh, it depends on how you, what you consider from scratch, but we'll cover that a little bit later. I will be talking a little bit about me uh, first and kind of my, a little bit about my background. I won't go too much into this just to give you an idea of, of who I am and how I ended up in, you know, the product design space. Um, we will talk about who a product designer is, um, how to get into that, or into that field and what it means to be a product designer. Um, the value of a product designer within, you know, the, the product lifespan or the, the product flow uh, process, whatever whatever word you use, um, the role of that product designer. Uh, we will talk a little bit about processes, my processes, the, you know, the tools that I use, what I do on a daily basis. Um, again, won't be focusing too much on the tools, but more on the processes, but we'll do a little bit about that. Um, I will talk about why 
I decided to make a shift. I would say a small kind of career shift from being, you know, going from a UI designer to a product designer, what that means for me, the prospects for the future and, and things like that. Uh, and I will also talk about my experiences as a product designer so far. And we'll, of course, do a wrap up at the end where I will summarize uh, a few of the points that we cover in this webinar. So let's talk a little bit about me, uh, not taking up too much time, but like Belinda mentioned, I do have a background in hospitality management. I worked in the hospitality, tourism, restaurant business for about seven years. Uh, then I chose to transition to UI design in 2019. And I did that with Career Foundry, starting off with their introduction to UI design, followed by the immersion course. And then I did front end uh, for designers as my specialization. Um, about a year after, or about six, not even a year, I would say about six months after I completely finished all my courses, I landed a job with a great company called Syndic for You, which is now called Syndic Yourself, as they just changed the company recently. Um, and I was kind of brought on board as the UI UX designer for that particular company or for that project. And during the course of my experiences um, within that company, a role opened up that kind of made me aware or gave me the ability to be part of product ownership or some partly taking part in some product ownership responsibilities. I mean, it was a startup. Um, and so if anyone is familiar with startups, it is like a very different environment. You have to be very dynamic and very flexible. And that's why I was also very keen to join a startup. I just felt I could learn a lot um, from being in this environment. And that was really important for me. So that's kind of how I got to you know, being called and now kind of having it, the title that says product designer, because I found a space where I can use my UX skills, my management skills that I, you know, developed through um, hospitality management, and then adding the extra product ownership uh, roles and responsibilities that I was able to take over in during my time at Syndic for you. And that's how I got here. Um, and before we continue, I think it would be good just to talk about what is being a product designer? Who is that? What does that person do? And how is that different from a UX designer or a UI designer? Um, and so this is how I understand it. This is very different for many product designers. You'll have product designers who will tell you, no, this, you know, maybe they focus more on research or they focus more on the UX phase. But this is what I, as a freelance product, uh, product designer within my own company, these are some of the things that, that I do as a product designer. So a UX designer, um, I think I'll just focus, you can just focus on the blue text because that's what, mo that's what most is most important is UX defines where an audience wants to go, right? So it's make, how do we make that service usable? How do we make it enjoyable, accessible? How do we get our, our users to go from point A to point B? What are their goals and how are they gonna achieve those goals? Um, a UI designer, which is what I specialized in, was, you know, UI helps them get there. You know, how are they getting from point A to point B? And how can we make that in not only enjoyable, but that they actually achieve their goal in an easy way that they understand? Um, being a product designer takes, a, let's say, a larger view of the entire puzzle. You're not just looking at one aspect. You're looking at the entire, you know, product process and after. So I would say a lot of UI UX designers focus on the new features and you're, you're provided some kind of outline on what those features require. The UX research has probably been done before and you need to make sure that you can bring that out in UI design once you get that information from the UX designer. Product designers look at what happens after. Product designers may be involved in testing this product. They may be involved in more communication with developers. Um, they could also be involved in looking at how that feature or product is behaving in the wild once it's already live, rather than only in the research and design scope. So we focus a lot more on what's already out there. How is it behaving? What do we need to work on? Which is, again, slightly a little bit different from a product owner, but not that far apart. You can use those terms kind of roles interchangeably, but... I feel a product designer has a bit a bit larger skill set in terms of design 
than a product owner that is more focused on the users and the business. So that's just to give you an idea that we focus on, um, you know, studies how, in this case, a car operates once the journey has begun. So that's what we look at or what I look at as a product designer in a lot of the projects that I work with. And that being said, I would like to look at product design as not what it is, but more who is a product designer? What are some of the fundamental soft skills and questions and characteristics that make a powerful or successful product designer? And this for me is three things that helps me decide, like kind of define what a product designer is. It's a, this person is a thinker, they're a tester and they're a creator. A thinker in the sense that they can deep dive and, and they investigate and they research and they communicate. Um, but at the same time, they're also asking questions such as, you know, are users reaching their goals? Um, are the business objectives still aligned with the product? Because we don't only serve the users, we also serve the business. So it's kind of a product designer looks at both aspects and tries to make sure that we are aligned. And that could be maybe being involved in planning and road mapping and prioritization and a lot of these other aspects that we'll talk a little bit about later. But at the center of everything is still empathy. It's still being empathetic. And that is something that we definitely hold at the center of one of the main characteristics you need to have to be a good and successful product designer. And so that being said, now we have kind of this who aspect. It's what skills do those come down to in simple terms? And these are some of the skills I think are really important. So being a good listener is all part of that, you know, communicating and, you know, being curious and, and things like that. But it's also listening to stakeholders, listening to what different people around the table have to say in terms of the product and making that something tangible that you can take and use for to better the product, for example. Um, being a good fisherman. I know this is a little, it's a little bit of a strange term, but sometimes as a, what I find as a product designer, you have to fish through a lot of things. You'll have a lot of information coming at you at once. This could be during the testing phase. It could be during the release phase. Um, and you have to find a way to fish out the information that you need and fish out those like gems that maybe got lost uh, in the, you know, in the process between the design and the development and the deployment and so on and so forth. Um, you also need to look at being able to plan and organize. This doesn't mean that personally you need to be a good planner and organizer in, in your personal life. It just means that you need to be able to plan and organize people, teams, processes. This is something that's very important as a product designer. You need to still have a creative mindset. Uh, so that's that design aspect at the end. Otherwise, it would be like product manager, which isn't really what you like to go for being a product designer is still being able to maintain the creativity and the processes of design but still being able to look at the product holistically and the last one is one of my favorites it's a bit of an understated one but the art of compromise this is a skill that i think is highly underrated but you'll find as a product designer you have a lot of stakeholders that have a lot of different visions and sometimes you'll find yourself um, needing to compromise. And uh, sometimes we say, okay, the users always come first and that's the truth. But we also need to understand that there's a business and their objectives and goals and budgets and things like that. So it's the art of compromise within the product space, which I think is a really, really important skill to have as a product designer. That being said, um, how to get into product design. It's a little different when you think about getting into, it isn't, um, I think, as easy or as clear cut as saying, okay, I'm just going to take a UI UX design course and that's gonna be okay or enough. Sure, of course you can do courses. So you, a, a routes that you could take, like the one I have here, which is other routes, which is coming straight from a bootcamp, which you can completely do. But some of the most common routes that I see are usually people coming from UI UX design. So maybe they are UX, you'll have a UX designer who's taking, you know, doing a lot of research and surveys and interviews and being in contact with users, but maybe they find they would like to be more, you know, involved in the product and the vision. And 
that's where they may see product design as something they're interested in. In my case, I came from UI design where it's a very, of course, it's, it's visual design. It's uh, coming out of XD and Figma and into other tools that are more management tools and figuring out how to think about the product, not just about the interface, but as the entire business, which is was really interesting to me. And that's why I really wanted to enter into product design. So the UI UX field is very common. The business route is also very common. So if you're in sales and marketing or any other aspect of business related fields, you could be attracted to going into product design just simply because you have a skill or experience from a different field that could complement being a product designer. Um, well, it's also common is having the development route. So you have developers saying, okay, I've been a developer or I'm a backend developer or architect, uh, but they want to be more involved in the product. They want to know more about it and be more involved and understand what it means to develop the product, you know, from ideation to deployment, for example. So they may find that product design may be for them. So it isn't about one route. It's there are many different routes to get there, but some of the most common ones are usually coming from other disciplines. So that's just my experience so far from what I've seen in, in the space. Um, and so a lot of questions that then come is, okay, you, you have a product designer, you get into this role, um, but what, what value do you bring? Right. And, and it, the only way to look at that value is to look at the responsibility and the combinations of those responsibilities. So I've just highlighted three of those combinations that you could have as a product designer. So the first one is, you know, planning and UI UX design. So this could be that you are heavily involved in, you know, stakeholder meetings and road mapping and workshops and defining user stories and things like that. And then developing mockups and UI elements and flows and full-fledged, you know, pixel perfect designs, and maybe also involved in the handoff of those designs. So that's just one possibility as your key responsibilities as a product designer. My the one I find myself most in contact with is the third one. And this is being part of the planning phase, being part of the UX phase and having this additional sprint management prioritization and testing phase. This, it looks like a lot, um, but it's not about doing, um, you know, three different jobs. I don't think that's the way you should look at it. It's having an individual who can have a holistic view on the product and say, okay, I can be involved in the planning to understand where we're going with this, pro with this product. Be part of the UX. Um, it could be even sometimes that, the this heavy you know ux work going on but then the ui work is not as heavy so maybe the company or product does not require a very intricately you know pixel perfect uh platform it could be a very simple platform that's just doesn't require a lot of ui because they're just pulling elements and components from already built libraries for example so that means you wouldn't require that much you know, energy there, but then maybe more energy is required for the sprint management and the testing. So the third one is what I'm most familiar with, but it really just depends on the project, the company, the organization, just the culture, everything. So as a freelancer, this is what I'm most uh, familiar with at the moment. And that brings me up to, you know, what do my days look like? Uh, yeah, very different from UI design. I can tell you that it's, uh, I felt as a UI designer, I was kind of in my own bubble where I could just, you know, be creative and design and it, it was fun and I, I really enjoyed it. But I think as a product designer, you have, like I said, the accountability is higher, the responsibilities may be higher. Um, and of course the tools are different, right? Um, so I won't go too much into the tools. I'm gonna do that a little later. So just the daily overview was probably me, you know, I would see myself coming in and checking Slack in the morning. So I check all my, my Slack channels um, in all the different, uh, projects that I work in, see what's been going on, what I need to work on, the ideas, if anyone's asking me questions or feedback. So that's daily communication. Um, I'll then probably do some kind of backlog management. Um, so just kind of check the backlog, I'll explain a little bit about backlog later. So if you don't know about that, don't worry. Uh, I didn't know about it either. <laughs> it's a term that's used that isn't that clear on what it is, but once you hear it, it's, it's not complicated. Um, but yeah, I'd probably do that 
followed by probably meeting with developers, uh, getting status updates on the current sprint. Do they have any blockers? Do they have any issues that they need to bring up that maybe is stopping them from continuing with an implementation? Things like that. Um, QA and testing is probably what I would do next. It takes up a lot of my time is testing things that are in review before deployment, um, giving feedback to developers on that. I will probably then, if, ne if needed, do some design work that could be low, mid-fidelity mock-ups, again, depending on the product, depending on the company and what they need. Um, if it's then high fidelity and pixel perfect, I'll need to do that during that time. Um, this is for upcoming features and, and things like that. Towards the end of the day, I'd probably do, you know, following up with um, bugs and issues that were brought up probably during the day or the day before, how far we are on, on solving those issues for those users. Um, and if it's a issue that keeps reoccurring, what is in the process? If it's a reoccurring issue, um, how does that come back into the product cycle for us to relook at and um, probably redesign if necessary? And then, of course, maybe just preparing agendas for upcoming meetings um, and things like that. So that's usually my typical day, uh, depending on which project I'm working on. Of course, it's different for every project, but generally, this is what it what it looks like. Um, and so that's what it looks like on a on a daily. Um, but now I want to get into kind of an, an overview on what the tools and processes actually look like. So in Slack, like I said, it's everyday questions. It's everyday things short updates, ideas, but usually I'll need to take, it would need maybe to take those ideas and put them, maybe use Miro to visualize those ideas for stakeholders and then hold meetings and things like that. Um, I'm a power user of both Notion and Jira, which I will also get into uh, later on in this webinar. So Notion is, is I'm a huge user of Notion. I really like Notion. Um, it's an all-in-one kind of organizational planning tool um, you can create boards. It's it's just great to understand what different team members need to do, how far we are on certain tasks and things like that. So it's a fantastic tool. And that usually will be in combination with Jira. So in case there's something that comes up on Notion that I need to do, it could be, I'll give an example, like um, maybe in Notion, there's a card that says I need to attend to a certain user story. And that user story is in Jira. So I would then need to go into Jira and if needed, hold meetings with different stakeholders to find out how we can you know, improve the candidacy of that card so it can later be put into a sprint. Um, I've already spoken about Jira. I'm also a power user of Jira. Um, not so much of GitHub. GitHub is more of a, what of our develop, like a power developer tool, I would say. Um, I use Jira, well, for basically sprint management. I think it's a great tool for that. Uh, just to keep everyone on the same page. And I just like the way Jira organizes um, their sprints and how I can utilize that to the maximum within my projects. So that's just kind of a little bit about the tools and the processes and what I do with those tools. Um, and those are predominantly product design tools, right? Uh, or product tools. Uh, the design tools that I use are, at the moment, like I said, a lot of my projects, I would have to say, at this point in time, are not what I would say design heavy. So it really it really depends. Um, if there's something that requires a bit more attention, um, maybe, for example, a more pixel-perfect design, or I need to do a high-fidelity mock-up, it's between XD or Figma. If it's something really simple and basic that I just want to just kind of get out there, like a sketch or something, I'll probably use Sketch or Miro. So it really just depends on what is required and what's the easiest and fastest way to deliver that particular deliverable. So that's just a little bit about the job and the tools that I use around my, my daily work life. So I hope you can see it and it's big enough, but this is just a screenshot of Notion. So I don't know if, you're, if anyone is familiar with Notion, but if you're not, this is for you. Uh, and if you are, well, that's great. Uh, and I guess you can also, um, kind of back me up uh, in this way, but Notion is really great uh, to manage your workflow. So here we have an example of a Notion board that is used to, for example, manage bugs and issues from clients or users. And so what you would do is you would just come in, create a card, create that issue and put it in a not started column. And what would happen is a developer would come in, look at the issues on that board and say, oh, okay, I need to pick up this issue. And I really like to separate, you know, the bugs and issues from the new features 
and not have that in the same platform. That's just how my mentor taught me to do it. And uh, I always thought that was a great way to do it. So this is just showing Notion and card creation and just kind of moving, kind of like a Kanban board, you would say, or Kanban philosophy. But this is, this is what we use or what I use Notion for. And this is a screenshot of Jira. And uh, like I said, Jira is the, yeah, my sprint management tool. It's what I recommend all my clients to use as well. And what it does is it helps you build a backlog. I said we're going to talk about this. So a backlog is simply a list of upcoming features, nothing else. It's just called a backlog. And it's just where you have all the user stories that are part of the new features that are coming, but need to be expanded upon or broken down into implementable bite-sized pieces for the development team to pick up and implement. Um, and this really helps to avoid waterfall situations where you're picking up big tasks that just never, ever get deployed. This way you can break tasks down into, you know, tasks and even necessarily into subtasks and plug them into sprints. And so this is what um, Jira is used for. And I'm actually in Jira almost every single day. So just to give you an overview on what that looks like. Um, and so we've talked a lot about product design and tools and work processes and what I do on a daily basis. But what I really wanted to cover as well was why the shift, you know, why did I decide to kind of go from my UI design, you know, bubble to product design, which can be chaotic and can be, uh, you know, I would say it can be difficult in some companies that don't have uh, good structures in place. Um, and then what to expect. Uh, from making that move. So, of course, one of the most important things for me was the growth aspect, just expanding my skill set. A lot of designers do it differently. You have some UI designers that would prefer to go into motion design and animation or maybe go into more gaming uh, design or things like that. I was just more interested in the product. I was more interested in having a louder voice at the table. Um, and I was more interested in you know, the life cycle and what's coming up next and the roadmap and, and things like that. So I really felt that product design, which is kind of an element of product ownership was something I was really interested in. So it was just the growth and the expanding of my skills and what I chose to go into. Like I said, it's also, you know, more product, please. I just wanted to know about the product. I wanted to understand it and I really wanted to deep dive into it and that for me is fun and enjoyable. It isn't for everyone, but it was for me. Um, and I'm also the kind of person who's always interested in like improving efficiency and productivity in how we get things done. And that's something that really attracted me to, you know, sprint management, prioritization, and these tasks, because I find that a lot of the time in, in products that have worked in the past, I just find that the process is not efficient and we find ourselves going back and forth. And I felt like, that I think if we had done things a little differently or if we had planned a bit better, um, we would not struggle as much towards the end when it comes to deployment. And also when you have to test a feature, if you did not write out the card you know, in detail, when it comes to be tested by someone, they don't know what they're testing because the card just wasn't properly described to begin with. So just many different things just on productivity and efficiency that I really enjoy doing. Uh, so I felt in general it was a good fit and um, I think it expands future prospects. So it's kind of saying, okay, I'm not just a UI designer. I have that skill set, but I also have product ownership skills that are strong and I'm confident in those skills. And for companies, this can be very attractive. So that was one of the driving forces as well. Um, increased accountability and responsibility. This isn't for everyone. Not everyone wants more responsibility, I guess. But for me, it's, I actually... In, like I'm one of the people that encourage accountability and responsibility. And I feel like in the product process, it's just lacking sometimes. And as a UI designer, you also, again, you're in a bubble. Um, and then once you finish that design and you hand it off, you kind of think, okay, that's the end of the story. And I just wanted more, I guess, from, from that process. Uh, it's also, um, I mean, the flexibility in the different kinds of work I'm doing is something I really enjoy. So it's not just design, it's planning, it's, you know, a bit of management, it's it's everything. And, and that's something that for me is attractive. And of course, uh, the higher salary opportunity is uh, of course 
definitely one of the aspects, not the most important aspect, but it is a, it is a good one. I just find that if companies can see that you have product ownership skills, it just increases your employability. Um, I'm not saying that wouldn't happen if you were a UI designer who you know specializes in motion design. I just felt for my skills, for what I can develop from my previous career, it was just a natural step for me to take on you know, being a product designer. So just a little bit about the salary. I'm not gonna go too much into this because it really depends on your location. It depends on your experience and your skill set and so many different things. But I can say for the between, you can expect in Europe, I mean, you have two examples above for permanent contracts, you know, between 42 or between 40,000 and 50,000. So anyway, between there is what you can expect depending on your experience and yeah, your skills and things like that. But I don't want to focus too much on that because most of my experience is with being a freelance product designer. I'd like to focus on that for, for this presentation. And that's because I work on an hourly or daily rate. And so I know that you can expect as an, you know, a mid experienced product designer anywhere between 25 and, you know, 40 euros. Um, as maybe if you're starting off, you can you can probably look at something like 20. I don't that's something that I think you could definitely reach for. Um, that's if you're going freelance, of course. Now, being a freelancer, that's a whole other webinar. I mean, you could have a whole webinar on the difference between, you know, being a freelancer or taking a permanent contract. Um, there are limited benefits, if any, for being a freelancer. If you manage to get into a company that offers you benefits as a freelancer, I think you're really lucky. So in terms of benefits, uh, you don't get that many, uh, to be honest, but uh, I, I enjoy the flexibility. I enjoy the 100% remote work or hybrid work. And of course, the unlimited holiday where I can just decide when I, and how I take my holidays. Uh, so I think that's attractive to me. And I guess there's a lot of people out there that's also very attractive to them as well. Now, the accountability with being a freelance you know, product designer does come with maybe having to do things like providing timesheets for when you work, uh, this is what companies will expect from you. So there's a bit more admin involved in being a, a you know a freelance product designer. You have probably have to invoice companies yourself. So there's a lot of other things behind the scene that you would consider extra tasks that you wouldn't really need to do if you just had a permanent contract. Uh, this didn't deter me, but it could deter other people from taking freelance projects. It shouldn't, but I think, um, yeah, it does. I, I enjoy being able to work on multiple projects at once. So right now I have three projects that I'm running at the same time, uh, all like two days a week, one day a week, two, two days a week. Sometimes I find myself uh, yeah, working on the weekends sometimes, which I'm not that proud of, but I think it's worth it. I, I really enjoy just this diverse, um, just being able to be in all these different projects. I learn so much. So I just feel that you learn so fast when you're in this environment because you're having to deal with different challenges, different issues, and you'll find you have the same challenge, well, more or less the same challenge in one project, but you can't take that solution and put it into another project. It also will require a totally different solution sometimes, and uh, it just keeps you on your toes, which for, for me, I, I really enjoy. So that's just a little bit about you know freelancing and you know being a freelance product designer. And at the coming to the end of all my webinars, which we are now, I, I like to do like a no frills, no nonsense, my experience as a product designer, just because I feel it's being transparent and gives people a realistic expectation on what, you know, moving forward, if you do decide to go into product design. We've mentioned a lot of them already. So, you know, it's a very exciting job. I think you have a lot of growth potential. You know, it's a higher, you know, higher employability rate if you can come in with some design skills and product ownership skills. More responsibility isn't necessarily always a bad thing. It also gives you a louder voice at the table as well and maybe even get you to a position to actually be part of the vision of the product, which I think is really great. Um, and I just think it's such a positive to be to have a deeper understanding of the product because this makes you a really key member of the team rather than just being, uh, you know, just the UI designer or just the UX designer. Uh, it makes also that you're really deep rooted in that in that product, which, which I think is great. Um, some of the difficulties, they're not negatives, they're just difficulties, is being a freelance product designer, you really have to be good at time management. 
because if not, it can lead to high levels of stress. Um, and you can find yourself, if you don't manage your time well, instead of doing, you know, your four days a week so that you can get the one day off, you end up doing, you know, six days a week and having to do a weekend or a Sunday because things just get out of control. So you really have to be very good at time management and be very disciplined. Um, otherwise, it can be, it will really deter your mental health. So I think you just have to be very careful about that. It can lead to move away from design. So if you are a UI designer like myself, um, this is something I still struggle with, completely honest with you. I enjoy the product ownership aspects of my job, but I also miss the creative part of my job, um, which is you know being in design and just being where I'm most happy. I guess I'm most happy when I'm designing. I've, I've said that a lot, but I also find that there is a lot of satisfaction that I get from the product ownership aspects of my job. So just to understand that if you're, you know, if you really enjoy design work, you can still do that, but just know it may take you away from your, from that every so often. And the last thing is, of course, the learning curve may be a little bit steep. So you may find that um, it's it's quite a quite a climb to to come out of design into product ownership. But it is absolutely doable. And if you're up to the challenge, um, I think it's great. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity to give yourself um, in that regard. So to wrap things up, uh, which is at that coming to that time now, it's basically understand that product designers are molded over time. So this is not a, a you know a career you can just jump into and, and, and be good at or, or train yourself to, you know, in a sense on your own to be good at right out of a boot camp or something you need to be molded over time and allow yourself the time to grow into that role. And that's why it really helps to be immersed in the product. So if you get that opportunity, definitely do that. Um, you know, you have to understand, you also have to shift your focus. So if you're used to being a designer um, who is very, you know, focused on design, you have to understand you may have to, you know, spread yourself a little bit over the planning, designing and testing phases may have to repeat those every so often, but it's just to understand that the focus does definitely shift when you are a product designer. Um, another thing is mentorship is really important. Um, this is just my experience, but I think that product ownership, design, these interchangeable words, um, it's an art. It's something you develop over time with experience because you'll need to make a lot of errors to learn from those mistakes. And that is very, it depends a lot on all the different products and organizations that you're working in. So if you can get a mentor to help you in the beginning phases, it is invaluable, especially with product design, with those elements of product ownership embedded in your daily tasks. Some of the entry points that we talked about, um, I would say that if there are any opportunities in your current role, and it could be anything, um, even if you're not necessarily in UX design, you could be thinking about going into UX design, but think product is really interesting. Try and get into those roles, even if it's only in a, on a minimal capacity. So just getting the opportunity maybe to have conversations with product owners, you know, try and see if your organization will give you the chance to just take some of those responsibilities and see how you work with them and later on make the transition. Um, I would also say if not, so if you're coming out fresh out of boot camp or you're just going straight into product management or product ownership, I would definitely say prepare your CV to reflect that and your portfolio. So that doesn't only apply for people coming straight out of boot camp, but if you're like, for me, being a UI designer, now if I go to apply for roles that are product design related, definitely my CV and portfolio has to match that. So it's not just going to show my design skills, but it also has to show my other skills as well. Um, tools are very important for product designers. It's more important than for UI designers who are like, oh, it doesn't matter which tool you use. Tools are very important. You do need to use them because you, if you use them efficiently, they will help you do your job even better. So they're really important. And it, OK, the salary aspect is important, but not the most important part. Uh, focus on the growth and focus on the goals. And if you have all those things in mind of everything we've talked about today, I think that your, your transition, if that's it, what you're doing, or just simply thinking about product design, I think it's everything from this presentation will give you a really good idea on how to approach that in the future. So thank you guys so much for listening to this, uh, to my presentation on product design. 
And uh, I guess we get into all those amazing questions now. <laughs> Hi, Kylie, again. Hi. Thank you so much. It's been great. Great presentation, super complex. We have learned so many new concepts. What is a backlog? This is amazing. Like, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Been, yeah, always a pleasure to, to watch you presenting. And yeah, and the people is super interesting and curious. And we they have posted uh, a lot of uh, questions. So thank you, everyone, for being engaged and, and posting your questions. Um, before we start, are you ready? I want like to give you a time, you know, like to stop and before we go and address all of the questions. No, I'm ready. I'm As ready. I'm good. <laughs> great, Kylie. Um, okay, so before we start with the question from the audience, actually, I would like to ask you something. Mm -hmm. uh, you have explained why you switches, uh, you change it from UX design, UI design, let's say, to product designer. Mm -hmm. But I would like to go to the beginning. Why did you decided to career change from hospitality to UX designing? Why did you pick UX design? Okay. Yeah, so or originally, the, of course, there was that big debate, right? So um, I, I actually didn't know uh, anything about UI UX design when I was in hospitality. So it's um, I decided to actually make the change, to be completely honest with you, because I was burnt out from my previous career. Uh, there is no other reason. Um, I just felt that for my life I wanted to have I didn't want work to always be so painful and difficult and and work is going to be hard it's always going to be hard but um I just felt where I was at that point in time I thought if I continue down this road um this is not going to get any better and, and I've mentioned this in in my previous webinar as well where you know if you're thinking about making the career change I always said I mean you know where you are right now and you can either say okay you know what that looks like and if you want more than that, if you want more of the same thing that you're doing, then don't career change. But if you want to make a change, you have to make the step. So I, I that, that was the reasoning uh, fundamentally, just moving from hospitality. It was just being completely burnt out with the long hours. And let's be honest, the pay is not great. So <laughs> yeah. That's that's the, the, honest, um, the most honest answer I can give. Uh, the decision between... UX and UI came down more to my characteristics. I felt I could have done either. So when I decided, uh, you know, when I found Career Foundry and I saw all the different options that were being, that were available to me, I could have done UX. But when I really thought about the characteristics I have, what makes me most excited? Am I excited to go out and do research and, you know, find out more about users and identify, you know, their goals and things like that. Did that excite me? Or was I more excited to sit down in the design environment and create components and colors and typography? And, and I just felt like that made me more happy and, and excited me more than, than UX would, would have at the time. Uh, so that was fundamentally my reasoning. Um, and I also felt that Career Foundry was the best place for me to do that. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Yeah, I know. It takes a lot of courage uh, to career change, but I think uh, we have to be patient and just take action and to do it. We are not happy with our current role. So, yeah, great, Kylie. Um, thank you. Now we are going to take a few of the questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. I would like to start with one that is coming from LinkedIn. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounce anyone's name. It's not intentionally. Um, so Samuel is asking, because I would like to stay from the beginning, how did you get your first job after finishing your CF program? Right. So I got my, actually got my first role, well, it was through LinkedIn. So that was the, the you know, the platform that gave me the option. So I think that's a lot of people go to LinkedIn to check on, on job postings. Um, and so that's where I actually got my initial um yeah, where I got the position from or where I found it. And I think initially I was a little bit skeptical about the role because uh, I realized that the, the company I knew was, was like a real estate accounting company. That's what I understood about it at first. So it was a company that was involved in real estate and creating an accounting system for, you know, apartment owners and, and things like that. I wasn't quite sure if that was something I wanted to do, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to give it a try. And I think because I'd had a background where in an internship I had done before, 
I had done it with a real estate company. So I think when they saw that, they thought, okay, this is really interesting to have a UI designer that has an internship in such a, it's it's a bit of an odd place uh, to find your first, ex, you know, your first internship in real estate compared to other more attractive uh, industries or products. Um, and I think that just attracted them to saying, okay, you know, she, she already has this kind of idea of real estate. Maybe this would be a good, good fit. Um, but what it, I think what landed me the role in the end was actually not, I mean, I had limited experience, but what landed me the role is I think the way I conducted the interviews, the way I presented myself and actually just being real. Um, and that's really hard when you're looking for a job. So that's, I think just, you know, when they asked me, you know, why do you want this job? I, I was actually honest. I said, I want this job because I really need this job. And because I think I would be really great at it. And if you give me a chance, I can show you that I can be really good at this job. And it was that honesty and that transparency that in the end, uh, they decided to go with me over actually someone else who had four years experience. So it is, at the end of the day, just the feeling for the person. But that's in, initially where I got my first role at Syndic for you. Right. Amazing. Thank you, Kylie. Um, let's go now um, from a question from uh, Naomi. She would like to hear again the skills of product ownership mm -hmm. and how can we market ourselves when we are not having um, a background in hospitality management? Right. So product ownership is, I mean, that, that, I mean, even just saying that that title is a, is a whole different webinar, but I'm going to just, uh, the key, what you have to understand about product ownership that's different from what I would say different from design is the focus is not so much, I mean, it is, of course, on the users and what we're trying to build, but it is more on the process and how to achieve the goals that the team needs to achieve and how can we lead this idea from idea to deployment. So that's just, that's the first thing I want to say. And so pr product ownership is very much involved in every phase of the product lifecycle or the product process. And so that's why the skills that I mentioned before in terms of being fundamentally having skills in testing isn't about doing a testing course. There is no such thing. It's just about you being able to take a product and treat it like you need to play around with it like you are a user. And the only way you can do that is when you've built um, a user story beforehand that's clearly you know, stipulated, this is what we want the users to do, this is what they need to do. So all the skills around organization, planning, prioritization, being a good listener, being, you know, taking deep dives into conversations to really pick out these fundamental needs. Because sometimes we get, and a lot of projects I've worked in, I don't, I mean, I don't say I have been in contact with a lot of users. I am in contact with a lot of stakeholders that are in contact with users. So it will be a situation where they think they understand what the user needs. But when you start picking and peeling back their information, they actually don't know what we are building. And so it's your job to, to, to do that and to really find these gems in all these conversations that are happening with all the different stakeholders. So that's why the soft skills, patience, empathy, these are more important than say, you know, you have to be very good at writing a user story. You have to be very good at this. You have to be very good at pulling out the gems from all these things. And that is what takes the experience and, and the time and the mentorship. Um, but I think if you're starting off, there are a lot of things that you, you'll actually find you're more equipped than you think. It's just because the title looks different and, and, and things like that. But I learned that a lot in hospitality. If you're the kind of person that, for example, you have a, a, somebody walking into the hotel and they are just really upset about something. Maybe they came from the restaurant and they are just telling you the problem and just screaming at you or something. How do you handle that? You know, and it, it sounds very extreme, but it's picking out what is the actual problem, putting it aside and then taking it apart and thinking, what can I do to fix this? What can I do so this person does not remember this bad experience, but remembers what I did for them? That's just an example of picking, you know, from my previous job, what, what that skill set it gave me. And this happens in a lot of different fields, whether you're in education, whether you're in, you know, the medical field, it's about taking the problem, removing the problem, but then setting it aside, you know, it's there, but what can you do to solve that problem? 
And that's that's what is is so important for for product ownership. I think I think it's an understated thing, but it's it's very important. Great, uh, thank you, Kali. I hope now with this reinforce the answer and the presentation about uh, soft skills. Um, I think soft skills are super important, but you can learn them mm -hmm. regarding regardless the background you have and the profession Absolutely. you are doing. So yeah. it's it's good. Um, so okay, let's go for uh, let's stay in the same topic of mm -hmm. skills because the people is very keen on that. Sure. Um, so Inga is asking how deep your understanding of in software development or programming should be, I guess, to be a product designer. That's a very, very good question. Um, if you're asking about my particular, I have very limited, very, very limited coding and software, uh, like anything to do with coding and, and software and things like that. I have very limited uh, experience, should I say. Um, but it's a very good question because you find as a product designer, you are more in contact with developers than you are with any other stakeholder. That, that's been my experience so far, just because I'm so heavily involved in testing and QA and things like that. Um, I think it's, you don't need it. It's not to say, you know, you have to have, you, you have to know this knowledge to be a product designer, but within the scope of work on every day, you will have to deal with technical jargon. You will have to deal with somebody telling you, you know, something on the back end or explaining to you something about Firebase and how to use it or taking you through GitHub and things like that. But you are free to say, hey guys, um, that's really great. Thanks for that. But could we break this down? Because, you know, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm here to help the process and help us get to deployment. So it's it will be such a positive if you have it. So if you do have that knowledge, that's great. Um, it's fantastic. But don't, it's also not allowing developers to take you down the rabbit hole. Uh, and that's really important as well. Is also that you're not a developer and you can't pretend to be a developer because, you know, it's just not going to work. It's actually going to end up you in a bigger problem if you try to try to understand the technical logic behind implementations. So what I try to do is I... I like, to, I like them to take me through demos. I prefer you to show me a demo of what is the expectation on this card. I ask my questions and if there's something that isn't correct or something that isn't right, you will know as a developer, as your skill set, what needs to happen to fix that. But I don't, you do not need developer or software skills to be a product designer. But good if you can know when to press the pause button on the jargon. Great, uh, thank you. I hope you get this um, answer your your question. Um, I would like to ask you, but did you do you have some knowledge? Did you learn in the program or through the when you are in contact with the developer? Did you learn a bit of programming? Just you know, like slight bits of it, or I, I did. I did learn a lot from them sharing the screens uh, and when they would show me when something is broken. And so I actually learned more to use the inspector tool uh, than I ever have. So <laughs> the inspector tool, if, if those of you don't know, have any contact with that, it's like this, you just go into Chrome and you right click and it opens up all the code and the elements and the console and everything. And, and I actually learned how to understand when something was broken. So if, if something wasn't working, I go in the console and I see all the errors popping up, I'll think, okay, something here is not working. And sometimes in the code, it kind of tells you where something is not fetching in the back end or something like that. But this, this actually, they developers, if you just ask them, they're very happy to explain it because it helps make their job easier. So that if you can detect something that they don't have to sift through, and if you take that upon yourself to learn and to understand, it will only make your life as a product designer easier. It's great. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, okay. There is a very interesting question here. I love it. Uh, Lalo's is asking what kind of products have you already worked for? Like, it's kind of interesting to see the example right. then. Okay. All right, so of course I've, okay, I've worked for, for Syndic for You, which is was an accounting platform, a SaaS accounting platform uh, targeted at um, building owners in a building. So for example, if you have you know an apartment building and you're one owner, there are costs related to that building, there are things that need to be done. And so we provided a SaaS uh, product that helped 
the manager of that building to split the costs and how it actually worked was the you know we made it a user friendly platform that any person in the building could manage that so they didn't have to hire a professional to do that they would just you know in your general assembly say okay you're going to be handling the the building this year so uh we gave them a platform to be able to do that so that was syndic for you um another product that i work with is called wix and wishes and this is not just it's actually an e-commerce business and they actually specialize in making handmade candles and are based in Nairobi, Kenya. So I do all their digital work, um, not just digital, but also all their marketing content as well as print. So that's anything from flyers to their barcodes to everything. So anything that's digital or print related to design, I'm, I'm involved. Um, another company that I've recently become in contact with is Farm Better, which is an agricultural based product. Um, and they have an app on the app store that helps farmers to detect um, issues that are happening on their farm and to be more sustainable and basically just give farmers that um, the power to address issues on their farm immediately. Um, another product uh, is one called Pangea Risk. And this is a risk assessment platform based in Africa and the Middle East. And I've, I've recently been working with them, which has been really great. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, that's just a few of the projects that I, I work with so far. Uh, there's a few more that I've worked with in the past, but those are the ones that I think uh, to me come out more. I mean, I've, I've built websites or designed websites for, for you know, small businesses and there was a life coach once I, I built her, her designed her website for her. So there's other, there's other ones, but uh, these are the ones that I'm, I'm currently engaged with uh, at the moment. Amazing. Thank you, Kylie. Actually, um, a lot of people is asking about your freelance jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so Samantha is asking, how do you find those freelance jobs to work on those so amazing projects? Right, right. Oh, this we should have a webinar on just freelance. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. right. Actually, su surprisingly not, most of my freelance gigs, I get from my network on LinkedIn. So it's other people that I've worked with. So the, the first one came from actually uh, the, the previous CEO of, of uh, Syndic for You. He actually recommended me to, to Pangea Risk. And uh, so that was a great collaboration. That's how I ended up getting that gig. The, the rest of them have really just been word of mouth. It's just, it's just people saying, oh, you know, you know, we have this startup. Or, oh, yeah, if you need a designer, I, I got one for you. And, and so that's kind of how that works. I've actually not yet gone and looked for a freelance gig. It just kind of been lucky enough for it to just land on my lap at this point um but yeah that's uh it's not we're not always that lucky um in the future i will probably have to hunt down my own uh my own gigs but so far that's my experience so my network is very important to me uh, on linkedin and every person that i connect with is is somebody that i value and uh, i hope i can also bring value to them as well great definitely kylie mm -hmm. uh thank you for it um okay so Inga, again, is asking about freelance contract and the relation with the remote job, which is now super, um, a very inter interesting topic. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, is a freelance contract more likely to provide remote job possibilities or how common remote positions are in product design in general? This is a I, I actually think that freelance positions are a lot more flexible with remote work. So I work 100% remote. There's not a single one of my projects that are hybrid or anything. I'm 100% remote for different countries around the world. And the great thing is that most of these countries you'll find, or most of the companies actually, um, they either don't have the budget for a full-time you know, product designer. So they'll, they'll probably contact me and be like, hey, Kylie, you have this experience, you, you have this you know, could you be with us, you know, one or two times a week and let's see where that goes. It's to get their products off the ground, you know. So I think if you're looking freelance, um, I, you're very likely to get 100% remote work from what I've experienced so far. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm mindful of the time because we actually reach the hour and I'm enjoying so much the chat and the people is asking so many questions so i'm sorry if we don't um address all of them um 
Uh, I, I would like to ask you one question, which is now super trendy. Okay. The thing with um, artificial intelligence. Okay. So I would love actually to hear your experience about that. But Paul is also asking, how does uh, AI affect this field? Wow, that's a that's a huge question. That's a very big question. Um, how does it impact my? I can only talk about how it impacts my products. I can't say how it impacts, you know, the the bigger picture of being, you know, product own, like being a product designer. But I know a lot of my projects, they're just not there yet. Honestly, they 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 are they're trying to get up with it. We have a lot of. Um, I have, a, I have a project right now that is heavily utilizing, um, you know, chat GTP and, and things like that, uh, which is, it's growing. But I actually right now for my projects are still very much in like the, in like the phase of just trying to develop their processes. They're, they're nowhere at the moment near to anything AI. Um, and I'm hoping that's where we move. And I'm hoping that we get the opportunity to work with these uh, different uh, softwares and things like that. But at the moment, the projects I work with, I've not encountered anyone who is even ready for, for that kind of move at the moment. I'm sorry, I can't give you more on that at this point. <laughs> oh, definitely, it was good. Um, yeah, people are super interested now in artificial intelligence, but I think it's gonna, it's gonna change the, um, the industry, obviously, because it's evolving, but it's gonna bring a lot of more opportunities. And we just have to know how to use it mm -hmm. um actually i'm a huge like i actually use um it is part of the uh, an ai tool that i use regularly at the moment if we can talk about a tool is notely ai uh -huh. which has helped me tremendously so in in a project where you have a lot of stakeholders in meetings the transcription it does for me i don't have to take notes during meetings this is fantastic so if i i think i use more and more ai tools now than i did in the past but in terms of the organizations and teaching people, especially if it depends on the group. It also depends on the country. Some countries just are just not there yet in terms of their organizational structure and culture. They're just not ready to accept that yet. But it's definitely on the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like ChatGPT. I don't know if you use it for it. Yes, but I yeah, I do. Yeah. It's super useful. So it's kind of, you just have to take the advantage and have it as a yeah. help. You know? So Absolutely. Absolutely. Improving our lives and our jobs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, um, now I have one question from Queen. Okay. It's asking about tools. And I know you are very familiar with those with Figma and Stacked. So Figma versus uh, Sketch. Sorry. Sketch. Oh, my yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, it's all good. <laughs> um, so which software in in your professional opinion, is used more in the industry now? That's a no-brainer, I think. Uh, I mean, Figma is, is is light years ahead. I mean, Sketch, the, the only reason I mention Sketch is because it's um, a product that I take in my stack for companies that just are not ready to pay for full-fledged, uh, you know, uh, design software. Figma is fundamentally free, um, but I find that... I mean, for sure, it's just light years ahead. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just not the kind of designer that's very tool specific when it comes to design. When it comes to, to project management or product design, that's different because I think it'll take a lot to convince me that Notion and Jira are not the way to go. Those are industry standards that I think I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, but when it comes to design tools, I mean... I think because a career foundry, I just became proficient with Sketch because at the time when we were doing the courses, we were using Sketch. I don't know if it's still the case for UI design, but we were encouraged to use Sketch. So that's what I learned on. And then later on, uh, like for the Syndic for You project, I used Adobe XD. So I, there was only Adobe XD. But then I have other projects that maybe um, require different powers within the tools or different plugins that I can probably utilize better in Figma. So it really depends. I'm just not, a, when it comes to design, I'm not tool specific. As long as it gets the job done and helps me to get it done fast and I can maintain the design environments in a way that works best for me, that, that's, all I, that's all I care about, really. Awesome, Kyle. Yeah. Thank you. It was sure. very clear. Great. Um, okay, one last question I would like to close. Um, 
the Q&A session because a lot of people is asking about the background they should have for mm -hmm. product design. I would say as we have been speaking before and in your presentation, we have seen that it doesn't matter the background. Of course, it could be a help, but what matters is the soft skill that you have and you can transfer to your new uh, role, mm -hmm. the one you are looking uh, for. So the last question is from Shahina mm -hmm. and she's asking, does the type of degree someone has matter to become a product designer? So if you've done a degree in the past, I'm, I'm guessing this is so you've already yeah. done a degree? No. Like I think not at all. I, th I really think it doesn't matter what you did a degree in. You could have done a degree in law. You could have done a degree in medicine. You could have done a degree in agriculture. I think there's a space for everyone in every industry. So you can think about it. I mean, let's say, for example, you take agriculture, for example. If you had a degree in agriculture and look at the product, project I'm running now, which is from Farm Better, that would be a great fit for them. You know, if, if they could have the benefit of having that agricultural knowledge, plus you having, you know, product, you know, getting maybe doing a product design course or something like, uh, I'm sure Career Foundry is by now caught up with that trend. Um, if, if you do it with Career Foundry and then you come with that along with your degree, that should not hinder you at all. And I mean, I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. I came from hospitality and I only had, I only have a hospitality management degree. And it's a bachelor's degree. I don't even have a master's degree yet. Uh, but I focus more on 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 what the industry needs and what companies need. And I'm I'm not focused on trends on, on what's trendy to to do a course in. I'm looking at all the companies I've worked for. Where are the problem areas in these companies, and how can I fill that problem area? And that's just how I think about my career is filling in those gaps. Amazing. Thank you, Kylie. Yeah. It's a pleasure to hear you. I would stay here the whole <laughs> evening, but I think we uh, have I would to love to too. <laughs> we have more. I always love doing these these yeah. talks with, with, with you guys. It's always so much fun and, and the audience is always so great and so in interactive and just it's it's so great uh, to, to have these great conversations with you guys. Great. Thank you, Kylie. Actually, we are going to have more upcoming events with Kylie. So uh, please okay. stay tuned for them. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, thank you so much, Kylie, uh, for a great presentation, for answering all of the all, all uh, those questions. Sorry if we um, missed some of them. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I hope that also the audience have enjoyed it so much. Um, before we close the webinar, um, I would like to tell you about our special discount that we are offering this month, a career change scholarship worth up to $1,285 and 1,125 euros of the full price of our UX and UI design programs. And if you would like to receive more information, I recommend you to book a call with one of our program advisors. And you can do that by simply clicking on the sticky note that you can see at the top of the chat. And also, please let me remind you that we have a fantastic blog uh, at Career Foundry run by our team of editors with plenty of great articles about UX, UI design, product design also, and more topics. Uh, please also check out the Career Foundry YouTube channel, which has a lot of great video content. And finally, please check out our events page because we have more upcoming events uh, just like this one. Um, okay, I would like to uh, give you um, a few seconds so you can uh, say any final words, Kylie. If you yeah, would like sure. no i just want to yeah again just want to thank everyone uh for being here and for listening and for engaging it's, it's always so great uh, to be here and of course if there's questions that we miss or you put in a question that uh maybe didn't get answered feel free to contact me on linkedin um i'm sometimes a little slow but i'll, I'll get there i'm very happy to answer questions and to support where i can um think uh, designers helping designers is just the only way to go so i'm happy happy to be here and to help thanks a lot belinda Thanks okay. a lot for being here with us, uh, Kylie. Always, always a great host as usual. Uh, great, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, and thank you everyone. I hope you all have enjoyed it so much. And I'm looking forward to see you in the next one and also to see us in the next one, Kylie. Absolutely. Okay. Have Absolutely. a great day. Have a good Bye. evening. See you guys. Ciao. Ciao.